Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us in this great presentation on protecting yourself from a fall. I'm Stacy Dunn. I'm from the Juniper team at Trellis and this presentation is brought to you by Juniper, Starkey Hearing and the Alzheimer's Association of Minnesota and North Dakota. We have two great presentations today and of course a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, please stay muted during our presentation. That helps us prevent some of that background noise. And we'll have time for questions at the end of both present at the end of the whole session. So we'll we'll let both presenters present first. If you'd like to put your question in the chat so you don't forget it, then feel free to do that at, at any time. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Darcy Carroll from the Alzheimer's Association. And Darcy will be sharing the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's and how they tie into falls prevention. So Darcy, take it away. All right, thank you very much. Let me just make sure I can do my share screen here. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great, okay. Well, uh, thank you everybody. And again, my name is Darcy Carroll and I am a community educator for the Alzheimer's Association. And I volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association because as I suspect might be the case with many of you, uh, my family is directly impacted by Alzheimer's. So my mom has Alzheimer's and before her, her dad, my grandfather has Alzheimer's. So I volunteer to learn as much as I can about this disease to help my parents and also learn about it uh, myself and help, help, help other people as well. This presentation is normally an hour long presentation, so I'll be going through um, some of the slides, not all of them, but the key to this presentation is to walk away understanding what are typical memory changes that happen as we age and what might be more significant signs of dementia or Alzheimer's. And then if we do suspect dementia or Alzheimer's, what do we do about it? We'll also link it into fall prevention um, because there are mobility symptoms as well as memory symptoms that occur with Alzheimer's and dementia. Before we get into the 10 warning signs, I think it's really important to just understand what do we mean when we say dementia or Alzheimer's. You might sometimes hear those two terms used interchangeably, but they're not quite the same thing. So we're going to hear from an expert um, on what specifically is dementia, and hopefully you'll be able to hear the sound. Dementia is the umbrella term for an individual's changes in memory, thinking, or reasoning. There are many possible causes of dementia, and Alzheimer's is the most common cause. Other causes of dementia are vascular dementia, which is marked by changes in the blood flow and the blood vessels in the brain. Dementia with Lewy bodies, identified by specific brain changes throughout the brain that include the buildup of a protein known as alpha-synuclein. And frontal temporal dementia, which is marked by brain cell loss in the front sections of the brain or the frontal lobe. Each type of dementia may have distinct characteristics to cause specific behaviors in the individual. But there is also some overlap in behaviors among the types of dementia. So basically dementia is the broad term that indicates uh, issues with thinking or behavior or memory. And Alzheimer's is a specific type of dementia, and it's in fact the most common type of dementia. And relevant to Falls Prevention Week, there are actually several types of dementia where there is a movement component to it. So you saw on that list frontotemporal dementia. That's what we believe the actor Bruce Willis has. That's typically um, seen through initial behavioral or language changes, but there can also be a physical component like spasms or rigidity or balance issues. And then also Lewy body and Huntington's dementia have movement components as well, where falls and balance become a risk. So let's learn specifically what we mean when we talk about Alzheimer's. 
More than 100 years ago, Dr. Alzheimer described specific changes in the brain, what we now call the formation of plaques and tangles. Alzheimer's is a progressive brain disease that's marked by these key changes and impacts memory, thinking, and behavior. The brain has three main parts, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. Each one plays a role in how the body functions. Alzheimer's disease causes nerve cells to die, which leads to brain tissue loss and causes loss of function and communication between cells. These changes can cause the symptoms of Alzheimer's, such as memory loss, behavioral issues, problems with thinking, planning, and at the end stage, swallowing. So right now there is no cure for Alzheimer's. So it's very important to understand uh, whether symptoms that someone is showing are leading to Alzheimer's or dementia so that we can talk about treatments and action plans as quickly as possible. The Alzheimer's Association has put together a list of the 10 most common warning signs of Alzheimer's. Now, this is not a checklist. So if you go through this and you say, okay, if someone has seven of these 10, does that mean they have a 70% 70, 70 chance of getting Alzheimer's? That's not how it works. These are just 10 of the most common signs that might indicate that a thinking or memory problem is an indication of dementia or Alzheimer's. As we go through each square, I'll give examples and I'll weave in maybe examples from my personal life contrasting what my mom exhibits to maybe what uh, I exhibit. The first square talks about memory loss that disrupts daily life. This is one of the most common symptoms of Alzheimer's, especially early on, and it's all about forgetting recently learned information. So someone with Alzheimer's might have problems remembering important dates. They might repeatedly ask the same questions or increasingly rely on memory aids or lean on other people for uh, memories that used to come to them quite easily. In contrast, a more typical change that you see related to aging would be occasionally forgetting information, but remembering it later. So if I think about my mom, um, earlier in my career, I worked and lived in China and I had my mail forwarded to my parents' address. And every week I would talk to my parents and we'd start off the call and my mom would say, what mail do we have for Darcy? And we'd go through the mail. But then later on in the conversation, she might also say, what mail do we have for Darcy? And at the end of the conversation, she would ask, what mail do we have for Darcy? Forgetting that she had just mentioned that earlier in the conversation a few minutes ago. So that was a clear sign that she was not remembering recently learned information. In my case, I get frustrated because I might forget the name of a coworker, a former coworker that I had worked with a few years ago, and I can picture the person's face, and I know I know their name, but I just can't reach it. It's on the tip of my tongue. Well, if I go look them up in LinkedIn, and I see their face, and I see their name, I remember it from that point on. It's not something that I continually forget. So that's the difference between what might be normal age-related memory change and what might be more significant. The second square talks about challenges in planning or solving problems. So someone with dementia or Alzheimer's might experience new difficulties in functioning, including developing or following plans, where opposed uh, a, nor a more normal memory change that might come with age would be making an occasional error in a bill. Now I'm going to play a video from someone who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's who can describe what this is like for him, because I think it's pretty poignant and does a very good job of describing what this sign looks like. I was probably spending four to five times more time preparing for something than I did, say, five or ten years ago uh, to, because of the, uh, I would lose my thought, I'd lose my focus, I'd get anxious, I wouldn't get the sleep, I was thinking, of this, I was in my sleep, I was thinking about what I was anxious about, which was what I was trying to remember, which was what I was trying to prepare, which I was trying to do. Uh, so it was a, it was a really a vicious circle. Of, uh, so I was able to control it a lot um, so that people on the wouldn't see things and, and, and that there weren't things to be seen. It's what was, what was disturbing me was what effort I had to put into uh, to, to do the things I used to do more easily. Yeah, so the key here is that things that didn't used to take as much effort uh, are taking a lot more effort now or there's a big change in skill. 
The third square talks about difficulty completing familiar tasks. So people with Alzheimer's might have problems completing daily tasks that they used to do easily. An example might be driving to a familiar place, remembering how to play a favorite game, forgetting a family recipe that you had memorized for years, or maybe worse yet, confusing sugar or salt within that recipe. Uh, a more normal age-related change might be difficulty remembering newer tasks or tasks that are new in technology. So for example, in my case, I constantly have to ask my husband how to forward videos that he texts to me because the process on my iPhone uh, isn't obvious, but that's a more a a normal age-related memory issue. The fourth square is confusion with time or place. So someone with Alzheimer's or dementia might lose track of the days or the seasons or important events. Um, my mom, for example, doesn't know when her birthday is anymore. She knows she has a birthday, but she's surprised on what day it is. Same with, with major holidays. A uh, more normal example might be getting confused what day it is, whether it's a Tuesday or Wednesday, but then remembering later. So since I have um, eased into retirement, I often wonder, okay, is today Wednesday or Thursday? I can't remember. But it's not because I don't know that there's a Wednesday and a Thursday and one comes after the other. It's just that without a specific routine, Wednesdays and Thursdays often look the same, and that's more typical. The fifth square is, is trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. And this is particularly critical when it comes to preventing trips and falls. So someone with Alzheimer's or dementia might experience vision problems, which can lead to difficulties with balance, trouble reading, problems with judging distance. So that means they might have trouble navigating their environment or driving. Uh, a more typical age-related change in vision might be something like cataracts. So my dad has cataracts. My mom actually has good vision, but the way she processes vision is different. So for example, when she sees a shadow on the front porch of her house, she thinks that someone is standing at the front porch of the house. She thinks the shadow is a person. On my most recent visit to her, she saw a shadow in the backyard and asked if it was a tiger. So she and I see the same shadows, but the way she processes that visual information is different. And then the way that you navigate the environment might be different. It might put someone at risk for trips and falls. So that's a really important um, symptom to be on the lookout for. The sixth square is new problems with words in speaking or writing. So someone with Alzheimer's or dementia might have trouble following a conversation, uh, forgot what they were talking about. They might have problems finding the right word, uh, call things by the wrong name, or use descriptions rather than the actual name of something in order to communicate. A more typical age-related memory change would be occasionally having trouble finding the right word, but then remembering it later. That happens to me all the time, where I can't remember the word that means something, but then a few minutes later or a few hours later, I'll think about it. In my mom's case, to give an example, she loves doing crossword puzzles. And so I'll do crossword puzzles with her. Her skill set is diminished, but we still do them together. But what happens is if the clue is something like uh, the place where a bat lives, instead of thinking of the word cave, she'll start thinking of words that rhyme with bat. So she'll guess, oh, a hat or a mat or a vat. So she processes language differently. The seventh square is misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps. So I'm sure all of us have misplaced objects at some point in our lives, and that might occur more frequently as we get older, but we can retrace our steps. Someone with Alzheimer's or dementia might not be able to retrace their steps or figure out the logic of where the item is. So again, just contrasting my case and my mom's case, I lose my keys all the time but I can figure out where they were because I can think, okay, I drove myself home and I got in the front door. So I know they're somewhere in the house. When I walk through the front door, if they're not on the table stand by the front door, the next place I went to was the kitchen, maybe around the kitchen table. If they're not there, they might be in the bathroom because I went there next and I can kind of follow through my steps and eventually find my keys. As a counter example, my mom takes her wedding ring on and off all the time. And when she can't find it, we try to help her find it. And we try to say, well, did you have it when you went upstairs? Did you have it when you went to the bathroom? But she doesn't remember. And there was one time where we couldn't find the wedding ring and we looked frantically for it. A week later, my dad texted me and said, I found the ring. I said, great, where was it? And he said, it was in a bag of grapes in the refrigerator. 
So there's no way to be able to retrace steps to find that lost object. And that's the difference between someone with Alzheimer's and someone who might have more normal memory changes as they age. The eighth square is decreased or poor judgment. So individuals with Alzheimer's might have changes in judgment or decision-making and use poor judgment or pay less attention to things that are important like everyday hygiene or grooming. A more normal age-related change would be forgetting something important like maybe an oil change, uh, but remembering it later. Remember that you should have done it. Again, to use my mom as an example, when she was working, she was meticulous about how she looked. She had makeup on every day. Her hair was perfectly coiffed. She wore very nice outfits. She was also very neat at home, kind of a counterbalance to my dad who piles stuff up everywhere. Well, now my dad has to lay out outfits for my mom to wear. And when she sees the outfit laid out for her on the bed, she might not remember that my dad laid it out for her and she might go try to find another outfit rummage through clothes that might be hers or my dad's. And next thing you know, there's piles of clothes everywhere because she can't remember what's hers, what's clean, what's dirty. And it doesn't bother her the way it used to. Um, my dad also has to put together a schedule for her about what the temperature is, uh, what she needs to wear, whether she needs to wash her hair that day or not. So her um, focus on grooming and appearance is a big change and, and that is gone. The ninth square is withdrawal from work or social activities. So um, as we age, it might be typical to feel less interested in some big family or social engagements that we used to enjoy. Um, but for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia, they might start to lose their ability to follow or hold a conversation. And as a result, they might start withdrawing from family or social engagements, especially if they're losing confidence in their ability to interact in those uh, engagements. Um, so again, to use my mom as an example, she has trouble following conversations, especially if they're long or if there's multiple ones going on at the same time. And so when we go out to eat as a family, she withdraws. She, she goes there because we take her there, but she doesn't participate in the conversations. The last square, square 10, talks about changes in mood and personality. So individuals with Alzheimer's or dementia might become confused or anxious or uh, fearful or depressed. Um, whereas a more normal age-related change might be we have routines that we're used to, and if something disrupts the routine, we might get a little bit upset about it. So again, to talk about differences in my mom and myself, uh, I'm a morning person, I have to have my morning coffee. And if that morning my Keurig decides it is not going to give me my coffee, I get snarky. And it sometimes lasts a while, I'm grumpy in the morning. But I contrast that with my mom, who in the early stages of Alzheimer's was aware that she wasn't able to do or remember things that she used to, and she used to get furious at herself, at the situation. Um, if someone would come over, she would, Ask my dad, Paul, who's here, because, you know, she doesn't want to display to someone what her memory is like. And it wasn't until um, she started getting diagnosed and got medication that the anxiety went down and the um, progression of the disease went down. So that's the difference between uh, changes in mood and personality that my mom experienced as someone with Alzheimer's versus what you might experience temporarily when your routine is disrupted. So those are the 10 um, warning signs of changes in memory or behavior uh, that we might all experience and maybe some hints about when it might be normal and when it might be more serious. Um, now we're gonna talk about if you experience these yourself or if you are concerned about someone who's experiencing those, uh, what do you do about it? And I'm just gonna fast forward through some of the um, slides that go with the longer presentation. Um, the first thing I want to make sure is that we understand the importance of early detection. Um, with Alzheimer's, uh, there are uh, drugs that are available that help the symptoms, um, and particularly these newer drugs, these monoclonal antibodies that have come out, they are specifically targeted at people who are the early stages of Alzheimer's. And so the sooner you get diagnosed, the sooner people can figure out if you're on the early stages of Alzheimer's and whether this drug would be uh, 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 an option for you. For my mom, she's on uh, other drugs that have slowed down the symptoms and the help has been absolutely tremendous. 
the earlier you detect what is going on, the more treatment options are available for you. And if the person is suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia, if you catch it early enough, that person can be included in the planning and the treatments that goes on. Um, I'm going to play a short clip from Dr. Salloway, who explains why it's so important for others to help someone who might be uh, exhibiting signs of Alzheimer's or dementia. You know, it's a very interesting phenomenon that people who have memory problems are often less aware of it than family members or their friends who know them well. One of the reasons for that is our ability to monitor ourselves, which is an important part of brain function, decreases when we start having memory problems. Not in everybody, but commonly in more than half the people with memory problems. And so the person is just not keeping track of the trouble they're having day to day. But the family members are, you know, paying attention. If they're paying attention, they see, boy, this is starting to happen a lot. And the person's not aware of it. So the family's more aware. And they may talk to their loved one about it. And they say, you know, I've noticed you've been repeating yourself. And they say, I'm not repeating myself. And that could either be due to the fact that they're not aware of it or they may not want to acknowledge it. So, you know, for those reasons, it's really important uh, to help someone that you care about notice the changes and offer to help them uh, address them. Um, the Alzheimer's Association also has uh, 10 steps that they recommend if you notice someone or you're concerned about uh, memory loss. Now, there are different slides for all of these, but I'm just going to hang out on this slide because in the interest of time and just talk about the different approach. Uh, the first one in orange is to assess the situation. So um, to actually write down what are the changes that I'm seeing this individual that I have concerns about and to gather information from others, because as Dr. Salloway mentioned, other people are usually the first ones to notice changes in the person's behavior. The second uh, part of the approach is to have a conversation with the individual. And it is really important to plan this in several ways. One is to figure out who should have the conversation with the individual. Uh, should it be a family member? Should it be a friend? Um, where should you have the conversation? It should probably be in a private location, not, not a group intervention. It should probably be in a location that the individual is comfortable with. And I strongly recommend actually role playing or practicing the conversation um, and approaching it with sympathy and with empathy um, to say, hey, I've, I've noticed these changes or I've noticed that you started asking questions or I've noticed that you might have problems hearing things. Have you noticed that yourself? Uh, would you be interested in going to see a healthcare provider about it? I'd be happy to go with you. Um, I can tell you that the way my family approached it with my mom initially is not the way to go. So my dad would say to my mom, come on, Meryl, just think, you know this answer, you know, and not recognize that she couldn't uh, come up with an answer or come up with something that she remembered because her her brain was not functioning the same way anymore. Uh, I was terrible. My, I noticed my mom was having difficulty hearing. And I said to her, you need to get your hearing checked, uh, which she was immediately defensive about. Instead of saying, hey, mom, I've noticed that you're um, asking the same question and this environment's kind of noisy. Have you ever thought that there might be a problem with your hearing? Would you like to go see a doctor and offer to go with her and be more empathetic? My brother um, would say, mom, you need to pay attention. You just asked me that question. So we were very um, abrupt and I would say unempathetic uh, to what was going on with my mom. Whereas my baby sister, who has the best relationship with my mom, would have been great to approach her and take her out to lunch and say, hey, mom, I've noticed a couple of things. Have you noticed these things? And my mom probably would have reacted a lot better and would have seen a doctor a lot sooner. So uh, I would say, make sure you plan it out, make sure you choose the right person. And even if the individual doesn't agree, keep having conversations with them because it's so important to go see a doctor and get a diagnosis. Um, I'll spend the last few minutes talking about what that means uh, to get a diagnosis. Um, the, uh, the importance of seeing a doctor is critical because there are conditions that cause issues with memory that might not be Alzheimer's and dementia. And doctors have the ability to detect that. Um, the different um, 
processes you can go through are medical history. Um, so when my mom went to see the primary care physician, he learned that her father also had Alzheimer's and a family history of Alzheimer's is a risk factor. You can do physical exams and check vision, check hearing, check reaction time, check balance. You know, when you're talking about concerns over someone's mobility or their falls. Screen for depression, because sometimes in particularly in older age, depression can impact memory. Interview close companions to understand what's going on. There are laboratory tests, there are mental status tests, there's brain imaging. So my mom went through an MRI uh, that can all help lead to a diagnosis of whether it is in fact dementia or Alzheimer's or something else. There are medications, there are problems with thyroid that can show similar uh, symptoms. So that's why it's so important to get the diagnosis and to understand what the options are for treatment. The last part is really to um, talk about what you do once you get the diagnosis. So as I mentioned, the symptoms don't always mean that you have Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, there are conditions that mimic it. But if you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia, there are treatments available. Um, as I said, my mom is on a couple of medications that have slowed down the disease and helped her lower her anxiety. I'd say she's actually very happy now. The monoclonal antibody treatments that are out now require that someone is uh, early in their prognosis and actually has evidence of amyloid plaques in order to get treated. There are other things you can do at home. So for example, if balance and motion is a concern with the individual. You can work with your doctor to figure out what exercises can you do with the individual to increase their balance, their flexibility, and their strength. You can get their eyes and ears checked to make sure that that is not impacting their balance and impacts trips and falls. You can change the home environment by removing carpeting or rugs or putting up uh, grips or improving lighting. So the sooner you get a diagnosis, the more you can do to help the individual. The last piece is understanding what your resources are. So besides other family and friends and uh, your healthcare provider, the Alzheimer's Association is a phenomenal resource. And I can say this on behalf of personal experience as well as uh, my bias as a volunteer for them. They have a 24 hour phone number that you can call toll free and it is staffed and there's access to people with master's degree training to help out with answers to common or unusual questions about Alzheimer's and dementia and other memory issues. Their website, alz.org, has tremendous resources available, including information about research, information about what to do if you suspect someone has memory issues, if you're worried about your own memory, it has training like one I'm delivering now. And also on that website, there's a community resource finder, CRF, and that helps you find out in my specific location what resources are available. So for example, with my dad, when he realizes that he can't take care of my mom by himself anymore, he can use the community resource finder, type in his zip code and find out what resources are available if someone can come to the house and help take care of my mom, or if he decides I need to look for assisted living facility, what assisted living facilities with memory care or nearby. That's what the community resource finder has. Um, there's also ability to take place, take part in clinical trials. Those are uh, a link to that is available on the website as well. So just a tremendous resource. So I know I went through this very quickly. So I'd say the most important things to remember from this are to recognize the 10 warning signs of what might be uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, or perhaps another medical issue, and what might be a more normal change that comes with memory as we age. The big clue is, are you seeing big changes from someone's normal behavior? That's the one thing to look out for. In the end, it's very important to see a doctor so that you or the individual can get diagnosed and have the widest range of treatment options so that you and the individual can plan for how to live with the disease until a cure is found. Um, that's what I have to share today. I will stay at the end for any questions that you might have and uh, I will turn it back over to um, the presenters. Oh, thank you, Darcy. 
Our next presenter is Dave Fabry from Starkey Hearing. And Dave will be presenting on Hearing Better to Live Better. There we go. Can you see my slides okay? And can you hear me? Excellent. Okay. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to present with you today, and I really enjoyed Darcy's presentation. I'm going to focus specifically on um, uh, the issue of hearing as it relates to aging, and I appreciate Darcy talking about the fact that in many cases with aging individuals who are at uh, who are, are, are suspected of having dementia or Alzheimer's, hearing loss can often mask um, uh, as dementia or memory loss or cognitive issues because of the inability to hear clearly. Um, and so it is really an important element in this. Um, in, in, in my past life, I worked at Mayo Clinic for about 15 years prior to joining Starkey in my role as Chief Hearing Health Officer now. As we mentioned, um, yeah, let's see, there we go. We are in the midst of fall prevention week, which this year falls uh, the 18th through the 22nd. Importantly, uh, fall prevention week is the days leading up to fall. So it's before the fall. And, um, and so I guess I come by this honestly because the first day of fall this year is February or, uh, September 23rd. And that happens to be my birthday. So um, I will point to some resources that you can look to to gain more information about the risks and the societal impact of falls. Um, and this is taken from the National Council on Aging's website, ncoa.org. Um, a couple facts that I'll just highlight briefly here that more than one out of four Americans age 65 and above falls every year. Once you fall, it is a strong predictor of the fact that you will have another fall within a year. One of the strongest predictors of people who are at risk for falls is if they've suffered a fall within the past year. They are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries among older adults. My mother unfortunately suffered a fall. The fall itself, while it did not uh, kill her, uh, led to a downward spiral of health that um, ultimately led to her death three years later. Uh, as a consequence of the fall. The economic costs in the U.S. in 2015 were estimated to be around $50 billion. The societal and emotional costs, I would argue, are even more significant because I believe many people, uh, in addition to having family members with cognitive issues, also have family members who may have suffered a fall and began that downward spiral. The issue is, is that people with mild hearing loss are nearly three times as likely to fall. And every shift in hearing that occurs beyond that mild degree of loss increases the fall risk. And that is because hearing loss does not occur in a vacuum. The hearing mechanism and, and uh, the ear, you may be familiar a little bit with the anatomy of the ear. Here we see it's divided into three main components, the outer ear, the part that you see and the ear canal, and then in the middle ear, uh, which houses the three smallest bones in your body, if you're a Jeopardy fan, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, or the hammer, anvil, stirrup. And then the inner ear is where both the inner ear of hearing, the cochlea, which you see is snail-shaped, as well as the balance organ. And you have one of these on either side. It looks very much like a gyroscope because that's precisely what it is. The audio and balance system are one organ embedded in the mastoid bone of your head. And you have one on either side. There is some redundancy. People can remain uh, with good balance with training if they've lost the hearing and balance function in one ear. But it is much better when both ears and both balance systems are functioning as designed. The other thing I, I need to mention is, is that your ears and your balance organ 
uh, is not where your hearing and balance resides. They're acting as sensors that provides input to the brain, in particular for the, the, the mechanism of balance, that balance organ on either side in combination with hearing input that can help uh, cue you to the location of things in your environment, plus vision, as Darcy mentioned, and even proprioception, uh, feet, uh, as you feel the surface that you're walking on. All of those act as sensor inputs, if you will, touch, uh, sight, hearing, and other uh, cues that tell the brain whether you're upright or not. And the whole issue really, uh, try to do balance exercises or try to remain your balance if you're holding on to something when you close your eyes. It's much more difficult to do balance training exercises when you shut your eyes than when they're open because you are getting important information about your balance from the combined input from sight, from uh, feel, uh, proprioception, and from um, uh, your balance organ directly. Now, I mentioned that hearing loss does not occur in a vacuum. Hearing loss is the third most prevalent chronic condition worldwide, with today, according to the World Health Organization, nearly half a billion people on the planet have what they consider to be a disabling degree of hearing loss. Over the next 25 years, that number is expected to double. That's because the global population is growing and we're growing older. Age is the strongest predictor of hearing loss. Hearing loss can strike at any point throughout life, from birth, from, from cradle to grave, if you will. But the older you are, the more likely you are to have a hearing loss. By the time you reach retirement age, for most of us at 65, a quarter of us have hearing loss. And in the ensuing decade, nearly well, half of us have a hearing loss by the age of 75. And in the US, uh, COVID notwithstanding, the fastest growing age demographic is the population aged 85 and above. In the next 10 years, the average life expectancy in the US will exceed 85 years. The second fastest segment is 100 years. So as we get older, hearing and balance issues become more important. And we're in the midst of um, a transition from the traditional generation uh, as the predominant users of hearing aids uh, with the aging baby boomers now, those born between 46, 1946 and 1964, uh, they're falling squarely in the target of a first time hearing aid user, which is just a shade over 60 years of age. Hearing loss is a top concern among the baby boom generation with 51% listing it as a top health concern. You see on the left-hand side of this graphic uh, that memory issues, hearing loss, safety and balance are among the top three concerns among baby boomers. Still, cardiovascular disease and cancer are issues that remain significant um, uh, mortality risks in the US. But if you want to get a baby boomer's attention, talk to us about memory loss and also about balance. I mentioned earlier that hearing loss does not occur in a vacuum. And this statistic just shows some of the chronic health conditions that impact individuals 65 and older. And you see things like hypertension, arthritis, uh, heart disease, diabetes, but also falls has a very high number of individuals that are impacted by falls in the aging population. And when we look at that, I already alluded to the fact that there is a strong comorbidity between people who have hearing loss and that elevated fall risk. I'll point out cardiovascular disease, people with heart disease have a 54% increased risk of hearing loss, diabetes, Hearing loss is twice as common in people with diabetes uh, compared with their peers who are not, and heart failure as well. More recently, in the past decade, a lot of attention has been focused on correlations in the aging population between hearing loss and cognition, with the correlation from a decade ago of mild hearing loss increasing the risk of cognitive impairment, and as that hearing loss increases, that risk elevates. I, I would be remiss today, even though this is indeed the focus is on fall prevention and fall risk, but given that high comorbidity with hearing loss, a very important study 
was presented in July in Amsterdam at the International Alzheimer's Association Conference, a longitudinal study that um, paired groups of aging individuals, 70 to 84 years of age, and monitored them over a three-year period. One group of uh, roughly 1,000 individuals, 500, were fitted with hearing aids by a hearing care professional, an audiologist or dispenser, and the other group was provided with counseling on healthy aging, but they weren't fitted with hearing aids. During that three-year time period, the overall population of 1,000 individuals did not show any reduction in cognitive decline on the 10 measures that they monitored over this three-year time period. However, very importantly, a subset of that overall population, numbering around 250 individuals, who were at elevated risk for cardiovascular disease in the form of hypertension and diabetes, when they were fitted with hearing aids, they had 48% greater preservation of cognitive function over a three-year time period than the control group who was matched for age and hearing loss, but were not fitted with hearing aids. So if ever, if you suspect on the call today that you have a hearing loss, or have a family member who has a hearing loss and has diabetes, high blood pressure, some of those cardiovascular risk factors, you should not delay because now we actually have data suggesting not only a correlation between aging and hearing loss and cognitive decline, but even a causal one, as long as you look at risk factors related to cardiovascular disease. And the reason that's important is fall risk, again, is elevated in individuals with cardiovascular risk factors because they can become dizzy, uh, especially when moving from seated to standing position. That, of course, is a recipe for falls. One of the things that I think um, at, during my 40-year career as an audiologist I've struggled with is we've constantly focused on the impact of hearing loss and really the threat of what occurs if you don't do something about hearing loss. Only a little over a third of the people in the US who have hearing loss actually choose to wear hearing aids. Um, part of this is due to affordability, but now we have an over-the-counter hearing aid category within the last year. It was a roughly a decade in the making, but to reduce that affordability issue, we haven't seen in other countries where they have over-the-counter or uh, healthcare support for providing the purchase of hearing aids that it hasn't necessarily increased the um, use of hearing aids, the adoption of hearing aids by those who could benefit by a significant amount. And I think part of it is related to this slide. The stigma associated with use of hearing aids remains a significant factor, a societal impact. I, it shouldn't be there, but it is. We're beginning to see a transition where people are recognizing that in, in the words of one of the advocacy groups, your hearing loss is more conspicuous than your hearing aids. And the intention to wear and benefit from the hearing gain that can be provided if you have a hearing loss that is treatable by a hearing aid or cochlear implants. The benefits of hearing aids are listed here, including that decrease onset of dementia, the improvement, if you will, um, in terms of social engagement and other associated health income, uh, outcomes. And I want to spend the remaining part of my presentation talking a little bit about one of our focuses uh, over the last five or six years for the company that I work for, Starkey, has been on what we consider to be caring technology or that connection to overall health and wellness beyond better hearing. Because as the title of my talk today implies, hearing better means living better and really taking advantage of technology that can help ensure that you're connected to other people. Helen Keller uh, unfortunately suffered profound loss of both vision and hearing. And while most people when faced with the hypothetical dilemma of whether they would choose to give up their hearing or their vision, would almost immediately say, well, I think I could do without my hearing, but I could never do without my vision. 
Helen Keller, who unfortunately suffered a profound loss of both, said that while vision connects us to things, for most of us, notwithstanding those who use manual communication, hearing is what connects us to each other. And that's where we um, have been focused on trying to address the risks of comorbidity related to first cardiovascular disease, and then I will talk about falls. In 2018, we um, became the first in our hearing aid space, in our, in our industry, to incorporate sensors that are worn in hearing aids. Most hearing aids are fitted in both ears. And those sensors can be used to detect rotation or velocity changes. How does that relate to uh, falls? How does that relate to physical activity? Well, a motion signature, if you will, for different events can be monitored and actually using uh, artificial intelligence, we can monitor and determine when a person is wearing their hearing aids, whether they're walking from a signature sort of event related to their gait. And we can do that by encouraging them then to take 10,000 steps a day, which we know lowers overall cardiovascular risk by 40%. The risk of mortality due to a cardiovascular disease factor can be reduced by 40% by taking 10,000 steps a day. Some lower amounts can actually still be significant in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk factors, but because hearing loss is so highly related to cardiovascular disease. We wanted to use these sensors in the devices that the patient nearly, all they have to do is wear their devices to, to monitor their physical activity when they're walking. As well, we can look at a signature that occurs when the patient is, is sedentary, is sitting down. Why is that important? Again, as it relates to falls, musculoskeletal strength is extremely important and just getting up and moving around for a couple minutes every hour will help ensure musculoskeletal strength and stability as you're moving from a seated to a standing position extremely important in uh, as we age that we continue to move around a little bit every hour and that's one of the things that we're monitoring and encouraging with the patients who are wearing these devices now, moving on to uh, from the physical activity to falls, one of the issues is that we can also see a motion signature with a fall event where as time goes by and time is indicated here, and then this movement and an abrupt stop, first we see a gait disturbance. And then uh, uh, when the person falls, they make contact, they momentarily hold still and then begin to stir again. That fall detection and that fall event is very different from uh, when they're walking, sitting, running, doing aerobics or exercise. So what we did in 2019 was introduced a hearing aid that could begin to detect falls when the hearing aid user was wearing their devices to alert up to three contacts that the hearing aid user can identify to receive a text alert in the event that they suffer a fall when they're wearing their hearing aids. If they do, and I'll, I'll walk through the process for that in a moment and a little bit about the, the science behind it, their loved one or even a professional caregiver can receive a text alert, contact um, the, the individual via a, a phone call or a text alert, and if they can't respond, they can even see on a map on their smartphone where their loved one was when they suffered that fall and send help or go to them for help. The issue, as I alluded earlier, is falls often start a downward spiral where after the fall, if there was a, a, a broken hip or broken leg, starts depression, removing themselves from social situations, leading in many cases to social isolation, reduce physical activity, muscle atrophy, and that cycle continues in many individuals and, and, and really accelerates um, the decline in overall physical and, and cognitive function. So uh, just to show how this process works, if a patient is wearing hearing aids and that sensor in either device indicates a fall, uh, as I showed you on the previous slides, 
Um, it compares between the two ears if they're wearing a device in either ear. And then when a potential fall is determined to have taken place, it will send an alert to the smartphone, which then sells it uh, sends it over cell or Wi-Fi to those trusted contacts that the individual has identified to receive those alerts. And then in turn, they can contact them, send help, or even see on a map where they were when their loved one suffered the fall. We tested the accuracy of these systems, the hearing aid systems against a popular neck worn type device and found the, that in comparison to the chest worn device, the accuracy in terms of the sensitivity to detect a fall when it took place and the specificity to not have false positives or to certainly not miss a fall in the event um, that a person suffered a fall and didn't send an alert was higher than the neck worn pendant in, uh, in all settings that were tested. One other thing, and Darcy raised this in terms of what is often a difficult conversation about memory loss and cognitive decline. We have a companion user app on a smartphone that a hearing aid user can identify family members. And really in comparison to that fall alert where they're choosing up to three people to receive those alerts, they can choose any number of family members or professional caregiver to download what we call a hear share app and the hearing aid user is in control of what they share with whom. They can share information about whether they're getting up in the morning and putting their hearing aids on. How many steps are they taking a day? Are they getting up and moving around throughout the day? Are they even exercising? And in real time, the person who has received with permission of the hearing aid user, this information can monitor and motivate the individual to be more physically active. They'll receive notifications that say the your loved one exercised today, they met their interaction goal. And they can even, as it relates to falls, make what can be a sensitive topic a little easier to discuss. If when seeing the hearing care professional or with the family member monitoring falls and near falls, near falls, are not events that just occur like when I'm sitting here now. But uh, one thing that, that I know, and I've seen it in myself when I, I have knee troubles, and in the aging population sometimes when you're lowering into a chair from a standing position, because of musculoskeletal strength, you plop into the chair. And that's because of that musculoskeletal strength, maybe on one side or both sides, that could trigger a false alarm as a fall, but it's not really, it may be an early warning indication for a conversation to occur. Because one of the issues where there's a shared goal is that family members and the hearing aid user themselves may want to have a win-win out of this. If I'm in the aging population, and in the case of my father died when he was 53, my mother lived till 82, she wanted to remain in her home, independently living, yet we were concerned about falls, about other things, safety in the home. And this can provide peace of mind regarding falls, regarding other safety issues. There's a manual alert that could be indicated by the hearing aid user if they felt unsafe or unwell, can use that same process to alert their family members that they need help or need their assistance. So it's, it's an area where there's a mutual goal. I wanna live in my own home as long as possible. Family members are concerned about my ability to do so. This can help encourage that independent living as long as possible. While a fall detection feature is great, we think, I'm biased, but we think it's a great feature, it's really almost too late in many respects, especially if a hip is broken or a limb is broken. So we've been in a partnership for several years now with Stanford University, where we're looking to try to identify individuals at risk for falls and using those same sensors in the devices, as I'll explain in the remaining couple minutes, um, try to uh, prevent a fall before it occurs. And in this case, let me just show you the participant inclusion data. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, 
suggests that healthcare professionals, primary care physicians, even audiologists can use three screening questions that can capture and identify 95% of individuals who are at risk for fall. If they ask one and they fail at least one of these three questions, are, do you feel unsteady while walking? Do you worry about falling? Or as I alluded to earlier, have you fallen in the past year? We assembled a group, um, a, a 250 individuals, and I'll talk about the preliminary findings that were presented earlier this year, was to investigate whether these hearing aids with this feature of a fall detection and motion detection can provide similar ratings to that of a healthcare professional who is trained on assessing risk of falls in a clinical setting so that the individual can be empowered to do that in their own home. Using those same sensors that I alluded to earlier, where we assembled uh, uh, 250 participants aged 55 to 100 with an average age of 78, 62% females, 37 uh, and, and some percent males, and we used the CDC's um, direct behavioral measures, they call it the STEADY protocol, the Stopping Elderly Accidents, Death and Injuries protocol. And what we wanted to do was compare the automated scoring on these measures that are designed to assess balance, strength, and gait, movement, and assess a human observer scoring them on these STEADY tests versus the automated scoring that can be done by a hearing aid. And as I mentioned, we had uh, 250 individuals and the tests are as seen here, stand side by side and try to balance for 10 seconds. Either a human is standing there with a stopwatch or we can do that automatically with the embedded sensors. Then instep, place the instep of one foot as it's seen in the graphic here, so that it's touching the big toe of the other foot and then reverse that. And then tandem, so that now you're standing with one foot in front, heel touching the toe, again with the goal of trying to balance for 10 seconds. That's looking at balance function. Then a strength measure is a 30 second chair stand where I'm standing up and sitting down without pushing on the side of the chair. Notice there's no arms. As many times in 30 seconds as possible. And then the last one, a gait measure, your ability to get up from a chair, walk 10 feet, turn around, come back and sit again. Again, this timed up and go has standard measures for assessing whether a person is at risk of falls. What we found was that observers have good inter-rater reliability across humans and with the automated scoring so that the idea and the journey that we're on is these initial results suggest that hearing aids have the potential to help identify and monitor individuals who are at risk for falling. Ultimately, we're looking at using this fall risk assessment, automated scoring, and combine that with balanced training exercises that a person can be done using their smartphone and measuring them to strengthen either their gait, their balance, or um, their, um, uh, their overall strength, if you will, and to assess fall risk and improve that fall risk so that with the long-term goal to prevent a fall from occurring before it ever happens. And I do need to acknowledge my colleagues both at Starkey and at Stanford University. Stay tuned, we'll be publishing more information on this as we move. We have a device already that, as I said, can be used to um, uh, detect uh, a fall when it occurs, but we are really looking at the longer term goal of preventing falls before they ever happen. And that's what I had prepared for today. And now I think we have some time for questions for either uh, Darcy or myself. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. Um, if you'd like to either um, raise your hand or put your questions in the chat, we'll make sure that we get to everybody. Those were both great presentations. Um, if you, it looks like we already have one question. It might be 
Um, it looks like a little related to medication from Rohini. Does Nerive help with them with memory loss? Yeah, I love. Sorry, go ahead. No, New Riva. That's the one. That, yeah. Is that a supplement? I'd never yeah. heard of it before. Yes, it is a supplement. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start off by saying I'm not a medical care provider, but I can tell you the philosophy of the Alzheimer's Association on supplements, which is they're not a regulated field. And so unless something is approved by the FDA, um, uh, and I've never heard of the substance and I do research all the time on Alzheimer's and dementia. I'm not sure of its effectiveness. I would recommend maybe doing some research of your own because supplements are not regulated. Um, often you can look at the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic or the FDA website to see uh, if this supplement has been clinically proven to have impact 